Hi, I'm John Bruni, and once again, I'm going to give you a reading from my new book, Tales of Unspeakable Taste, uh, available now at Amazon. And also, I still have copies of um, uh, shit poems still available, just a handful of them. Um, so if you really want in on that, you should probably get, on, get in on that very soon. Now, uh, we're going to do a little something different. A lot of you know me for my transgressive works, in particular, like um, the story going down, you know, the one about the guy who goes down on himself just so he could bite his own dick off. Uh, or Monster Cock, uh, Poor Bastards and Rich Fox, uh, Dong of Frankenstein. But instead, today, we're going to go with one of my quiet horror stories. Uh, I've written quite a few of them, actually. Quite a few of them got published. Um, but for some reason, I'm just not known for it. I guess the other books just sort of kind of mm, grab you by the throat quicker. Um, so, I'm going to read to you uh, a very personal story of mine, actually. Uh, kind of sort of based on a true story. But uh, it's quiet. And uh, it, it kind of wears its uh, influences on its sleeve. If you think of uh, Jack Ketchum's The Box, uh, you really can't uh, think of one without thinking of this one either. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to get you from my book, Tales of Unspeakable Taste. I'm going to read to you Snipe Hunt. My, look, my doctor, my eye doctor says that I should get bifocals. I'm resisting that, but I think he might be right. Um, so, forgive me a little bit. The words kind of move about on the page sometimes for me. So, I'm going to try my best. <clears throat> Snipe hunt. Heads up, Teddy. Here comes your kid. I don't, I don't even waste time looking up. While I've already had a few to drink, my reflexes are still good. My fingers automatically flick the cigarette into the campfire, where it turns brown and starts to shrivel. I promised Philly that I'd stop smoking, and I don't want to be caught in the act. Mark keeps puffing away. Kid looks kind of excited. <laughs> Think they found one? He winks. I utter a laugh. I'd never fallen for the snipe hunt ruse when I was a child. Even then I knew such an exercise was only an excuse for fathers to get their Cub Scout sons out of their hair so they can engage in adult stuff like smoking, drinking, and talking about women who aren't their wives. This is the third night of our outing, and I've been looking forward to sending the young uns out into the wilderness. Three days without nicotine. That first cigarette tasted so good. It, it nearly got me high. After having cast the fourth into the fire, though, I'm much more relaxed. Hey, Dad! Philly says. I finish off my schlitz and pop open another. What's up, Philly? We found one, Dad! A real-life snipe! I exchange a glance with my fellow fathers. All of them were a yeah-right grin, and it, makes me, it, it takes me a moment to realize that I have one, too. Are you sure, I ask? It looks just like you said, only it's bigger. We'd have brought it back, but we couldn't even drag it. The amused faces around the fire melt away, replaced by worry. It's as if we're thinking with the same mind. We're now certain that our sons have captured something. Maybe a dangerous something. What is the scariest animal out here? There are no bears, but maybe, uh, maybe they caught a baby coyote? What if the mother wants her offspring back? Images of the, old, of the other boys being mauled by a pack of vicious animals start to form in my... What's it look like? Don asked. Just like you guys said, it's kind of a big bird with a beak as big as my arm, and it has rainbow-colored feathers and long spindly legs and claws like hands. That is exactly how we described it to the kids about an hour ago. It's perfect. Almost as if they're trying to prank us. When I was a kid, I did the same thing to my old man. Practically gave him a heart attack. Huh. I forgot about that part. This is the first time that I'm reading the story, um, since I did fi uh, final edits. And I forgot about this part, because something happened between then and now. Uh, my dad did die, and he did die of a heart attack. I didn't... I didn't remember that part. <clears throat> I 
practically gave him a heart attack. <sighs> Excuse me. We just picked the smallest of us and put him in the sack and lured our parents into the trap. Is this what Philly had in mind? Like father, like son? The sad thing is, I don't know him well enough to make a judgment. I never married his mom. I keep up with the child support and I see him once a month, but I don't really know him. His favorite movie is The Sandlot. Uh, he likes to read old science fiction books, and he's a passionately fair softball player, but we never talk. It's not like I don't try, but he's just quiet around me. With his friends, he's boisterous and full of laughter, but with me, he's always kind of distracted. I don't think he likes me very much. At home, he's not allowed to watch horror movies, so I let him when he's with me. And if a booby makes an appearance, I don't tell him to close his eyes. It's not going to kill him, and besides, it makes him smile. What do you think, Teddy? Don asks. Should we see their snipe? He says, the way he says the word snipe is so patronizing that not even a baby would miss it. Even Philly catches it. We do have a snipe. See for yourselves. I shrug. Okay, Philly, take us there. We grab our flashlights and beer, and we follow my son into the woods. And we... As we walk, I take a hefty gulp from my beer, and I try to ignore the dirty look Philly gives me. He's in some kind of substance abuse class in school. Just say no. After having learned of the ills of vice, he has gone out into the world to convert us sinners. Last month, he decided, or rep, he demanded, that I quit smoking and drinking. I told him I'd do one at a time, because adults need some bad habits in order to have fun. I told him I'd stop smoking. The truth, I can do without the cigarettes. Kind of nasty. My fingers are yellow. My clothes stink. I can't even indulge this habit in public. So really, I don't like smoking all that much anymore. It makes me feel good, especially after a hard day. Besides, I'm addicted. It'd be nice to quit, but it's damn near impossible. Drinking, on the other hand, isn't so bad. It helps me unwind, and it's not like I drink the hard stuff. Maybe a couple of beers after work, or three on the weekend with some of my friends. I'm not an alcoholic. It just helps me maintain a social life. Philly can have smoking. With drinking, I'll keep that one. So Philly, says Mark, how'd you boys catch the snipe? Brent saw it first, Philly says. It was pecking at a dead squirrel's guts. When it saw us, it froze. Steve came up with the idea for some of us to flank it and scare it toward the others who were holding the sack. Did you hurt it? Mark asks. No, sir, but it doesn't like being in the sack. It's real mad. Again, the fathers look at each other. Will the sack hold it, I ask? Sure. The beak and claws aren't too sharp. Ahead through the, through the moats of fireflies, I see a group of boys holding flashlights. Philly leads me up to them, and I get my first look at the sack. Steve's the biggest of the kids at 5'7 and 140 pounds, so it's no surprise to see his meaty heads holding the sack shut. Whatever's inside is big, and it's writhing like a pit of snakes. A high-pitched squawk comes from the sack, but... It's brief and clipped. I look around the group of boys and start to count faces. It takes me a minute to match them all up to their fathers in my mind before I realize that everyone is accounted for, unless they found another kid, a co-conspirator. This is not a trick. They really found something out here and captured it. The other fathers have deduced this too, and once again we glance at each other. What should we do, Mark asks. I make the decision. Stand back, everyone. Steve, you too. But it'll get out if I let it go. It's okay. Just let go when I say. I kneel down to grab the bottom of the sack, and my cigarettes and lighter fall out of my shirt pocket. I hurry to rescue them from the dirt, but it's too late. Philly has seen them, and his mouth is thin as a paper cut. I haven't had any, I tell him. I just have them, well, you know, just in case. I can vouch for him, Don says. Philly says nothing. His face says it all. Why does this upset me so much? I can smoke if I want to. Philly's just a kid. He can't make me do anything. I jam the pack into my, into my pants pocket. When I look at my hands, I see they're trembling. Give me the sack, I say. Steve hands over the bunch opening, and I bend down to grab the bottom. I meant to turn the sack upside down, but it is heavier than I thought it would be. What the fuck is in this thing, I say before I remember I'm surrounded by kids. None of the fathers seem to care about my loose lips, though. All eyes are on the sack. Open it up, Teddy, Mark says. To hell with it. I pull the sack over to its side, and the thing within topples over with a squawk. It struggles harder. 
and I can feel it pushing at the opening with something long and hard, like a blade. The boys back away a little, and so do their fathers. Only Philly stands with me. It's okay, Dad, he says. You can let go. I let out my breath. My fingers drop to the opening of the sack. I tense up, waiting to see what will crawl out. Tales of Unspeakable Taste. Right there. Available on Amazon. Don't forget, shit poems still also available. Um, so yeah, a lot of my books are available too. You know where to find me. Thank you for your time.